Welcome guys and girls to this video. In this video, I'm going to go over this uh, Datadog report on 10 trends in real world container use. Uh, so I found this report quite good actually. Um, couple of points I wanna go over that will help you guys and girls uh, find out what's coming in the future, what areas of container uh, you should focus on, uh, what areas you should anticipate more and more interview questions, more and more real world pro projects all that stuff. And I like this kind of report because uh, this is from Datadog and uh, they created this report from the data collected from thousands of customers. Uh, so this is a real data driven approach, which I like. This is not some theoretical report. All right, with that being said, uh, let's jump in. So the first highlight is container orchestration is now the norm. Today, almost all containers are orchestrated with Kubernetes used by over half the organizations. Uh, so when we talk about orchestration, that means that companies are not managing the Kubernetes themselves. A self-managed uh, orchestration will be like if you install the control plane yourself on uh, virtual machines and then you manage it. But instead, companies uh, are using services like EKS, uh, like Elastic Kubernetes Service, or GKE, or AKS. And like I predicted before, a Kubernetes is becoming the most popular container orchestrator. So the first thing you should take away is learn Kubernetes. Like I said before, a Kubernetes is exploding and it is not too late. Companies are just starting to move to Kubernetes. So this transformation will continue for next five to 10 years. Uh, so there is a lot of time to jump into this. So study up and I anticipate on 2022, uh, generally, uh, all the jobs and stuff comes up in January, February timeframe. There will be even more Kubernetes positions. All right, so moving to the actual number one, we actually covered this one. Uh, nearly 90% of Kubernetes users leverage cloud managed service. We went, we went over this, so I'm not gonna go over it. So basically this says that Kubernetes is running on either AWS, GCP or Azure using their Kubernetes service. Number two, um, Amazon ECS users are shifting to AWS Fargate. Uh, so this is an interesting trend. So what that tells you is, even for Kubernetes, uh, companies don't want to manage all the things themselves. So not only they are using the orchestrator, such as EKS, GKE, AKS, even within the orchestrator, they are moving to a path of less management. So for those of you who don't know, uh, AWS Fargate is the serverless option to run your container. With Fargate, you do not need to manage any worker node virtual machine. So for AWS, you do not need to run any EC2 for Fargate. AWS manages all that. So the advantage is you don't need to worry about patching the EC2, AMI dehydration, uh, when you update any operating system or something, you don't have to worry about how to do all that. So uh, this report highlighting the ECS because ECS Fargate uh, was first to come in the market, then EKS Fargate came into play, but I anticipate EKS Fargate uh, being popular as well down the line. Number three, I'm gonna skip. It says average number of pods per organization has doubled. Uh, so basically that means Kubernetes is becoming uh, more popular, so more and more workload are getting into uh, Kubernetes. Okay, this one is important. Pod auto scaling is becoming more popular. Um, so this, I see it in the field as well. In the beginning, uh, when you adopt Kubernetes, generally you, you uh, containerize your application and then you use replica set. So replica set uh, just creates a certain number of copies of your pod. And if a pod goes down, another pod will come up uh, to maintain the number. But if the traffic goes up, it doesn't increase the number and the traffic goes down, it doesn't decrease the number. Replica set just keeps the number of pods at a certain number. So horizontal pod autoscaler does that for pods and then cluster autoscaler does that for the nodes, the worker nodes. Uh, so this is becoming more popular, which means that organizations are becoming more savvy. So when you go to uh, do interview, uh, expect questions on these areas like auto scaling, uh, cost optimization, uh, how to right size the pods, etc. So I have a separate video on horizontal pod autoscaler. 
if you are learning Kubernetes or you are going for an interview, uh, please make sure you learn Horizontal Pod Autoscaler. Either you watch my video, which I'm going to give the link up top, or someone else's. Uh, but make sure you study and practice those. So the number six, take it with a grain of salt. So it says organizations are deploying more stateful workload on containers. Uh, so basically they're attaching volumes or they're running some sort of database on their containers. But when you look at the actual uh, graph, uh, it doesn't show percentage, it just shows the number. So which is kind of uh, weak because if you see the number of stateful containers was 10 and then it went up to uh, 13 or something. Similarly, uh, for uh, PVCs, it went from like 18 or something to uh, 28. Um, and this is the average number of stateful sets and PVCs per organization. So still it's kind of low. So what this means is uh, even though there is a good support for stateful containers with Kubernetes, organizations are choosing the native cloud services for that. So uh, instead of running their SQL database on containers, organizations are choosing the cloud database. So basically for AWS, they're choosing uh, RDS MySQL, RDS Aurora, etc. Similarly, for file system, uh, instead of attaching a volume to the container, they are choosing EFS or Elastic File Source Storage. Uh, basically, the, the advantage is the cloud manages it. If something goes down, they will come fix it. And also it's much easier to use. Uh, if you manage your own state uh, on the container, that means you have to take care of uh, making sure it's highly available. Uh, so you have to make sure uh, it's running in multiple availability zone. You have to make sure it's scaling. Uh, you have to make sure if the uh, container image went out of date, you have to go update it, all that stuff. Number seven, uh, organization running container environments create more monitors. So by monitor, it doesn't mean like your monitor, like the screen you see stuff. <laughs> that would be something though. Uh, what that means is uh, more metrics to monitor, uh, they monitor additional uh, information, which, which kind of makes sense. Uh, if you run more and more different kinds of workload, you need to monitor different thing. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, probably an organization with a traditional workload, you only monitor CPU and sometimes memory. But as you deploy more and more uh, workload, maybe you can run Jenkins in it, uh, port rocks, uh, you could run uh, machine learning, EMR, all kinds of stuff. You need to monitor different uh, metrics other than regular CPU and memory. And how do you monitor stuff with Kubernetes? You monitor using uh, Prometheus Grafana, and then you can send all that to Datadog as well. I have a separate video on Prometheus and Grafana if you want to know what they are with a hands-on demo, check it out. I'll give the link up top. So number eight is kind of passive. It should not come up in your interviews. So organizations are starting to replace Docker with ContainerD as their preferred runtime for Kubernetes. Uh, so recently Docker has started to charge you a licensing cost. It used to be all free. Uh, but ContainerD is now still open source and free. Uh, so if EKS is switching to ContainerD, you don't need to do anything. You can still use a Docker and Docker runtime has nothing to do with Dockerizing your container. Uh, if you Dockerize your container, you have the container image that can run in any uh, runtime. Uh, so if EKS switches to ContainerD fully or Azure GKE switches to different uh, runtime, it doesn't really impact you. But this is an interesting observation. So number nine is kind of important. Uh, so OpenShift adoption is growing rapidly. So for those of you who don't know, think of OpenShift as an opinionated way to deploy Kubernetes. Um, so with regular Kubernetes, you have to install all the open source, third party tools. You have to create the DevOps pipeline. And one of the challenges with Kubernetes is there are so many options, so many open source third party tools, it is very difficult to know which one to use. Uh, so OpenShift kind of gives you everything in a packaged way. Uh, so it creates, it uses Jenkins for DevOps. So it will create the Jenkins pipeline for you. Uh, it, will, it will have all the monitoring software installed. Everything is kind of packaged, but you do pay a licensing cost. 
So if you are going to work or going to give an interview in a startup or mid-sized companies, don't worry about OpenShift. OpenShift licensing cost could be a little high for startups and mid-sized companies. And also startup mid-sized companies are more agile. Uh, people want to check different options and then uh, switch direction rapidly. So I predict that OpenShift will be more popular in big enterprises. So if you are going to work in big enterprise Kubernetes projects uh, or going to interview, uh, just make sure you know what is OpenShift. Uh, people don't expect you to know everything about OpenShift. Basically, if you know the Kubernetes concepts, that should be good enough uh, for interviews. And then if you know, hey, what is OpenShift? What does it do? Uh, study those and then you should be good. Number 10 is an interesting topic, but again, it doesn't impact you. Uh, so Nginx, Redix, and Postgres are the top three container images. But again, it depends on what your project is using. So Nginx, of course, uh, is the web server, super popular. And then you could see a couple of cool things like uh, now people are using more and more uh, GitLab container, Jenkins. I was surprised to see that uh, GitLab container is a little bit more popular than Jenkins. So that's interesting. Uh, I'm keeping a close eye on this because till now uh, I'm saying to my students that, hey, if you have to learn one DevOps tool, learn Jenkins. Uh, but I'm following this stat closely al along with the job requirements in uh, different job uh, websites data. Uh, so if this changes, I will, I will make a video on GitLab accordingly. All right, if you found this video helpful, please click the like button, click subscribe. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or what other types of videos you want me to uh, make. Uh, also share these channels with your family and friends. I uh, help this channel grow. As the channel grows, I get more motivations and I can do even more awesome things. All right, guys and girls, that's it for this one. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.